Uh, this is a power-packed hour. In the next uh, segment, Senate President Craig Blair will join us in this first half hour of the 9 o'clock hour. The House Majority Leader, Delegate Eric Householder, via telephone. E, how are you, sir? I'm doing fine. Good morning, Rob. Good morning, John. Good morning. Yesterday's speech must have been like Christmas Day for you, Eric. I think you've been working on this plan for, what, three, four years now? Yes, and it was uh, great news. Uh, I'm hoping that it will come to fruition. I mean, the the governor clearly spoke last night and said that he's heard the Senate president, that he's heard the speaker. You know, everybody wants him to do a big splash. So he said, okay, here's the tsunami that you've been waiting for. And the governor recommended last night a 50 percent personal income tax cut over three years, 30 percent the first year, 10 percent the second year, 10 percent the third year. So you're talking about $1.1 billion tax cut without any tax shifting, without any tax increases. So it's good news. What do you know about the meat and potatoes of how this is going to happen, Eric, besides the phasing of 301010? Well, we just got the bill this morning, and um, it's basically over three years. Uh, Also, I had recommended that we have a safety net of about $700 million, and we could pull that $700 million from the surplus that we're expected to have this year. You know, we're on target to have $1.8, $1.9 billion surplus. So I would like to have a safety net in, in case something were to go awry, That way uh, we don't have to go back and and raise taxes. Now, for your listeners, keep in in mind, if after this 50 percent reduction, if we if we're going to ever reduce any more, the next 20 percent or the next 30 percent, we're going to have to have some tax shifting, like possibly a a, a sales tax increase. Um, If not, we're just going to stay at the 50 percent. But. I think it's very doable. I'm very excited. I'm glad that he mentioned it. So I know the House is on board. In fact, we're going to run the bill uh, this afternoon in House Finance. So it's going to be one of the first bills that House Finance takes up, and they're going to probably run it out and send it down to the floor. It'll be down on the floor by tomorrow. Eric, is, news. is the plan for it to kick in in 2023, 2024, or what? No, it'll be first half of 2023. So we only have so if it's a 30 percent tax cut the first year, you're only going to see half of it in this budget cycle. So the first six months, if he makes it retroactive, you will only spend half of it. You know, the first six months, and then the other half of it will be in next year's budget, which is what we're working on now, the 2024 budget bill. When you say the half of it, you mean the half of the 30 percent? The half of the 30 percent is what the cost that we have to realize in the budget. So if he makes it, if he makes it uh, retroactive to January 1 of this year, that budget has already passed last session. Mm-hmm. So of that surplus that you're seeing, half of the cost will be expended towards that budget that we've already passed, the first 15 percent. Then the 2024 budget will see the the full amount and plus the other half. Does that make sense? Yes, it does. Now, you had mentioned trying to set aside about $700 million as a buffer. You had Mm -hmm. tried to do this last session, too, and the governor line item vetoed it out of the budget, did he not? Well, what I tried last year was uh, in case the 10% bill didn't get across the finish line, if the Senate didn't run it, then I said, okay, let's put that equivalent amount in the back of the general revenue surplus section of the budget for future tax cuts. So that's what that was, and that's what the governor vetoed. And then in July, that's when the governor decided to just to run a bill for a 10 percent personal income tax cut. So, John Gilstrap. So you've seen the bill. How is it structured? Is it as simple as say, ultimate? I can't do a 30 percent math in my head. So the, the ultimate goal, the 6.5 percent bracket becomes 3.25 percent and, and like that down for each bracket. No, well, let me be clear. I haven't actually seen it. We just received it this morning, okay. but it's up in House Finance, but I have not seen it. I wanted to see how those six brackets, obviously those six brackets would be adjusted to have a 30% tax cut. Now, whether or not it's weighted on the lower end or more in the middle or on the top end, I don't know the answer to that yet. So and those is, brackets will be adjusted. Is the House working on a bill that might be then a competitive bill for what the governor is, is doing, or have you all been waiting to see what the governor presents? We had a we have a vessel. It was the same bill that I introduced last year, the 10%, and we got sponsors. In fact, it'll be dropped today. But now that the governor made this introduction, 
we'll go ahead and we'll proceed with running the governor's bill, the bill that uh, that I'm introducing today. It'll be put on the back burner, and um, you know we'll, we'll just the governor's bill will take precedence. Eric, there so, are there are more than one ways to uh, more than one way to there is more than one way to skin a cat. He tried to say. Uh, so mm-hmm. will this be a combination of reduction of rates and increasing the different st- stratas of the tax uh, percentages? As you make more money, you you pay more taxes, uh, or will it be strictly a rate reduction? In other words, that sixty thousand dollar top end mark will that right. as a way of fluffing this? Is there will it go to a hundred thousand as the top end while the rates are, are, are jimmied a little? I don't believe so. I believe you'll just see the rates reduce. Uh, currently, our top income tax bracket is six and a half percent for those making combined sixty thousand. I suspect, like I said, I hadn't seen it yet, that maybe that rate becomes five point five or six percent. He will adjust all six income tax brackets. Is what I suspect he's doing. So, the governor also proposed several different ways of spending some of the surplus that we have and how to direct budget dollars as well and there there were a variety of ways probably a, a good dozen that he introduced and i took a bunch of notes on those and made mention of them in the previous segment that we had on the air uh how are you folks in the legislature going to uh, attack these as a priority for instance i know peia is clearly on your list of things to tackle he proposed adding a hundred million dollars into peia and finding a way to fix that uh, long term, he wanted forty million for hospitals. He he wanted ten million dollars for a stop hunger program. He wants to do. He recommended directing uh, ARPA funds in two different ways, including five hundred million for an economic impact fund. Your comments on that? Yeah. Well, let me just go down the list, and, and for your listeners, keep in mind most of the spending that he was doing last night were one-time spending items, and they're all out of, uh, there was $450 million left from 2022 general revenue surplus uh, unappropriated. So the $1.6 billion surplus that we had last year, there was $450 million left that hadn't been spent, and that's what a lot of those uh, uh, items that he was talking about. So, for instance, last night, he talked about a flat budget. Well, the, the budget's about $4.8 billion. It's about $224 million than what it was last year. But he offered uh, retirees, uh, folks over 70, who uh, are making a minimum salary of $1,000. He would like to do a one-time bonus of $1,500. Obviously, you talked about the PIT. You just mentioned the hospitals, the $40 million. That's for the reimbursement rates. The Senate has already ran that bill. They ran that bill yesterday, and this would be the supplemental that he's talking about to uh, raise the reimbursement rates up to 110 uh, percent for hospitals. He mentioned a $1 million for food banks. Uh, that has always been in the budget every year since the governor's uh, been our governor. But he did mention his uncle, Posey Perry. He would like to try to end hunger in West Virginia. So he, he pledged $10 million, and it would be for an emergency food banks for that money to be able to go out and, and feed other West Virginians. And I'll get back to the ARFA here in a second. But then he talked about uh, education. He talked about a pay raise for the fourth time. Uh, for all state employees and teachers, that's about $120 million cost. He did mention a hundred. And of course, that $120 million, if we were to do that, that would be base building. Uh, he talked about $100 million back in the PEIA. That's one, uh, one time. There's several what I would call rainy day accounts for PEIA. Uh, he talked about $100 million going into that, into that. He mentioned $15 million for 1,000 families for the HOPE scholarship which I'm unclear why, because the the Hope Scholarship is self-funded. We actually gave seed money to the Hope Scholarship uh, when we passed that bill of about $23 million. I I don't know why it needs another $15 million. I need to get into it and figure out why. He talked about $75 million for higher ed deferred maintenance costs. Uh, Let's see. He also talked about a million dollars for child pregnancy centers. Uh, He talked about the nursing workforce initiative of 20 million and then EMS another 10 million all those total about 427 million now keep in mind all these are items that the governor has proposed the legislature can take one of them the legislature could take all of them or the legislature could decide not to run any of them so as is the legislature's right correct 
That's right. It's our right to appropriate the money. Yeah. So, you know, some of these will be used for uh, give and take and, and to, to, to work out other bills that we would like to get across the finish line. So what do you see as the now, uh, as, what are your priorities, Eric, as you read that list and hear it out loud? Well, the ARPA, let's go back to the ARPA. Um, the ARPA is $677 million. That's the second tranche of the governor. Most of us believe that if we could spend, keep back $500 million for economic development, like uh, a small impact or large impact projects, <clears throat> excuse me, and then of that $500 million, you would have another $177 million left. Use that for water and sewer projects all across the state. Last year, we put in $250 million for water and sewer projects, and we're doing a good job. If we could put the other $177 million, we'll be able to do more water and sewer projects across the state. Now, if you ask me what my priority is, uh, maybe the PEI, the $40 million for uh, the reimbursement, the hospital reimbursement rates. But along with that, I think it brings to the discussion that we need to have a discussion on PEIA and what is our path fo- forward. Because right now, PEIA, excuse me, PEIA is not sustainable at the rate that we're going. Uh, for every dollar that we put into the PEIA, the recipients are supposed to put in 20 uh, cents. That's not happening. Uh, for years, we haven't seen any premium increases. We keep putting money into PEIA in what's called the backdoor approach. Uh, the governor has been circumventing the state statute, and we're putting money in the back door. The employees of uh, the recipients aren't putting in their 20 cents for every dollar that we're putting in. So I think that needs to be front discussion. Uh, we may need to talk about spousal support. Uh, that also should be part of the conversation. So I know the Senate passed the bill. I know there's many members on the House side that would like to take a, a good look at PEIA and see, are there any changes that we could uh, is this a, is this bill the vessel now to talk about these changes? Could privatization be one one topic? Uh, but that would take a several year, you know, put us on a three year path or something to privatize, because PEIA is costing the taxpayers almost a billion dollars a year. And uh, is it time for the for the state government to get out of the insurance business and completely cut? sever ties and let it be privatized, let a private company uh, handle it. These are all talks that we should be having because right now we have a terrible payer mix in the state of West Virginia. Uh, Most of our population is on some type of government-sponsored health care, whether it's Medicare, Medicaid, or PEIA. Our commercial market is shrinking smaller and smaller and smaller. It's only about a 10% mix. Normally, it should be about a 60-40 mix. But it's not it's so heavily leaning towards government-sponsored health care that if we don't soon do something, our commercial market's going to be non-existent. John? Assuming and, and the, the rails seem to be greased for the PIT uh, reduction, and, and that's lovely, does this pretty much put a nail, final nail in the coffin of the personal property tax, the Amendment 2-ish workaround proposals that we've been hearing about? I think it puts a nail in the vehicle tax. Uh, but I don't think it puts a nail. <clears throat> I don't think it puts a nail in uh, amendment two for now. Uh, I do believe that those discussions can come maybe next year. Uh, let's get let's see what dynamic growth that we can get because I've been saying along with others that when you have a personal income tax reduction, you're going to see more job creation, more wealth creation than you would with Amendment 2 that the, that the voters uh, rejected. So I think Amendment 2 has a place in time. Right now is not that time. Maybe in a couple years we could try it again. Maybe we could just pick equipment and machinery and, uh, or inventory. I mean, there's lots of options that we have, and we can, as long as we can whittle it away, we're still reaching the same goal as re- of reducing taxes. If I could shift, <clears throat> excuse me, shift the discussion a little bit to your new role as uh, majority leader. Congratulations! Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, you're you're wrangling a, a lot of delegates in within the Republican caucus, and you've mentioned in other at two other news outlets that um, you you consider one of your priorities to be communication to make sure that right, that right. The, the message is is spread throughout throughout the caucus. Where do you say the biggest challenges? Where are the chafing points that that are going to need the most salve? Well, communication was always an issue, uh, even when we had 78 Republicans. 
a lot of the gripes or complaints were that uh, they weren't getting information quick enough. So I'm from, uh, you know, I've been in the construction industry all my life, so I can pretty much micromanage this down to the nth degree. Uh, what we've been doing, what I've surrounded myself with 12 people. So we have a conference caucus. Uh, every morning we're having a caucus at 8 a.m., and I have uh, Clay Rowley. He's the conference chair, and he's got two deputies. He's got John Paul Hott, and he's got Doug Smith. And th- those three individuals are tasked with doing the daily briefing every day to to disseminate all that information. To, to uh, That way the, the, uh, uh, the members, they know exactly what bills are moving and what committee. Okay, and then the next uh, 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 group of people that's under my wing, so to speak, is the majority whip and his team. So you've got uh, the majority whip, you've got uh, uh, Marty Gearhart, and he's he has two deputies. He's got Erica Storch and Chris Pritt, and those and then and underneath of them they have ten assistant whips. Those whips will be going around talking to members. You know, finding out where are they on this bill? Are they a yes or a no? And that's clearly yesterday in a caucus meeting, I said, look, you're either a yes or a no. There's no maybe. If you tell a whip that you're going to be a yes, you need to be a yes. If you tell a whip you're going to be a no, you need to say a no. You know, and then the leaders, I have three leaders working with me. I have David Kelly, Laura Kimball, and I have Dean Jeffries. And our team, what we're going to be doing is meeting with the chairs of the major committees and the minor committees and once again, trying to listen, is there any gripes, grievances, what are you hearing? And we're trying to, to take all this information back and make it seam, seamless, uh, to, seamlessly for the members so that way they know where we're at all the time. If, if the reporting is right that I read this morning, you all dropped 486 bills on yes. yesterday. How, and you yes. got 60 days. How, how does that happen? I mean, do, And we have more that will be dropped. Remember, there's close to 2,000 bills that are dropped, and if you're lucky, 10%, 200 bills reach across the finish line. So uh, we have a we have uh, 10 caucus bills. Uh, they'll be dropped this morning, and you'll start hearing about those. And uh, we'll work our caucus bills first. That's the priority of the caucus, the, these 10 bills. Any other bills, they're all just a bill. Just a, They're not a priority. It, it, they're just like any other bill if it if it. Uh, meets the scrutiny of the members and it passes, then it passes. With with enough time to get across the finish line, right? With that, enough that time was... to get across the finish line, exactly right. So. And how much time does that have to be? Within 60 days to get it to the Senate and then to the governor, how long does... Well, by day 42, all bills need to be out of committee because a bill needs to be read for three days. And then on the 45th day, we have what's called a, a crossover day. House bills go to the Senate. Senate bills cross over to the House. Now... If we pass bills now, they are actually going over to the Senate. The Senate could take them up early, but normally it's on what we call crossover day, day 45. And then from that day forward, we run nothing but Senate bills. And then the Senate would run nothing but House bills. So, Eric, the governor also proposed $250 million be spent on getting all the state's labs under one Roof, one hundred and twenty five yes. million this year, one hundred and twenty five yes. million next year. Yes. Is that a priority? It, it I think it will be a priority and uh that money will be coming from this year's expected surplus. And uh I think you'll see that money earmarked for those labs. There was some conversation that do we need two hundred and fifty million? You know, I was a I was advocating no more than a hundred and fifty million uh, but ultimately, the governor made this decision. But like I said, uh, the legislature appropriates the money. So uh, instead of $250 million, we could maybe take it back down to the $150 million. So we have uh, choices here. That's what the whole budget process is all about this next 60 days. And uh, last question for you before you, well, maybe we may have one more. Uh, <laughs> Damon Wright, who's a local school board member asks mm-hmm. if there is a, any plans or why you don't stream committee meetings live like BOE meetings are required to do. So, Damien, all committee meetings are stream live. So you can listen to every committee meeting. They're all stream live and they're recorded. Oh, so there you go, Damon. I guess yeah. Damon got some bad intel. 
Yeah. All right. Okay. And then uh, next, as we as we move uh, through some of these things and let you go, because I know you have a very uh, busy day here, uh, Eric. In regards to triggers, like you had previously, I know you mentioned uh, having some reserve money. You mentioned seven hundred million dollars. You're going to try to set aside. But in regards to economic triggers for the thirty ten ten before it gets to fifty percent, do the same ones you were factoring for your uh, PIT reduction bill a couple of years ago factor in with the governors? There are no no triggers in this bill. This is a straight fifty percent. You're going to meet your first target year one, then next year. The only trigger would be if things were going awry, then the legislature could st- step in at any time. So, and, and keep in mind, after we do this 50% reduction, this doesn't hamper any future uh, uh, legislature from ever going back and saying, no, we want to cut it back down to 30, or it doesn't prevent any legislature from saying, no, we want to do an additional 20 or 30%. This is the first step to put us on a pathway to eliminate it, but it's it's dependent upon future legislatures to continue the path. And uh, I think once you see this, it may be year four or five before we even revisit it again, because you want to see if the dynamic growth is is actually happening. Happening, and, and that's incumbent because, like I said, you know, we, we believe that there will be wealth creation, job creation. So. After five years, if those metrics are happening, then we can have another discussion. Okay, how much more of the personal income tax? Remember, it brings in about $2.7 billion into the general revenue. Effectively, with the governor's bill, you're cutting it by $1.1 billion. So. $1.1 billion and takes mm-hmm. three years to get to that point. And John, John Hardy, the bill that he worked on before that's now law, the transfer tax, that returns money back to counties, uh, will that be accelerated during this session, Eric? John, yes. John spoke to me. He would like to get it accelerated. I said, well, you're the vice chair of finance now. Make it happen. <laughs> <laughs> that works out nicely. Well, that would be good if that did happen. That would return money yeah. to the counties faster. Eric, Absolutely. thanks so much. I yep. appreciate your time this morning, sir. Hey, have a great day, guys. You Take too. Care.